Hello everyone and welcome to my channel when I analyze all of the 20 CSEC English B poems on a weekly basis. In this week's video, I employed a line by line analysis of the poem A Stone Straw by Elmer Mitchell. This is a dramatic monologue in which the persona recounts an incident to an unknown listener whom he must impress with his manly aggressiveness and his unrepentant nature. So feel free to ask me any questions you may have about any aspects of the poem stanzas, themes, tones, moods, poetic devices, and their individual effectiveness. So without further ado, let's begin by reading the poem. A Stone Straw by Elmer Mitchell. We shout it out. We've got her. Here she is. It's her all right. We caught her. There she was. A decent looking woman, you would have said. They often are. Beautiful, but dead scared. Tossled. We roughed her up a little, nothing much. And not for the first time by any means, she's felt men's hands greedy over her body. But ours were vultures, of course. For justice must be done, especially when it tastes so good. And then, this guru, preacher, God merchant, God knows what, spoilt the whole thing, speaking to her, should never speak to them, squatting on the ground, her level, writing in the dust something we couldn't read, and saw in her something we couldn't see, at least until he turned his eyes on us, her eyes on us, our eyes on ourselves. We walked away, still holding stones that we may throw another day, given the urge. Okay, let's begin the poem with the title. The title of the poem is called A Stone Straw. Okay, and it's always important to comment on the title of a poem because it always gives us some clues of the content of the poem. Okay, I know sometimes there's some titles that can be deliberately misleading, especially in poems such as Dulce et Come Es, right? Because when we study that poem, you realize that the title is basically the opposite of what the content is about. But actually studying the title of a poem or reading the title of a, a poem or even a short story, it gives you a clue, right? It prepares the reader for what they're about to study or what they're about to read. So when we examine the title, A Stone Show, this term normally means a short distance away, right? We suggest that the participants in the poem in a, this particular event were not far from the woman in another sense. And of course, the poem is about the significance of throwing that stone to condemn someone else, figuratively speaking. Okay, so we know just by reading that title that the poem will be or is about or we should expect some, some form of stoning or maybe in a, a literal sense, that, and even in a figurative sense, that this particular stoning, even the person who is being stoned and the person doing the stoning, their crimes are similar, okay? So you should therefore be very careful when you're condemning someone. It's like the saying, those who live in glass houses should not um, show stone, right? So basically your challenges, your downfall, it, it, it's just a stone show, even somebody else's downfall. Right? It's just a stone straw away from yours as well. Okay? So let's begin with stanza one. So stanza one says, we shouted out. Notice that the person begins with the pronoun we. Right? It shows that the person is a part of a group, a hostile group. And we shout and we shouted out suggests that the person wants to bring this the particular act we are going to study in a while ago, bring bring it to somebody's attention. Okay? So notice the use of the direct quotation. There's the open quotation there by we, and it ends at all right there in yellow. So the person allows us to hear what they're shouting, right? And even by the words shouted out, oh, this is an example of auditory imagery because it appeals to our sense of hearing, okay? We want to, by using the word, word, such, word such as shouting, and even the use of the direct quotation, it appeals to our sense of hearing, and therefore the reader, it will want to actually pay closer attention to what is being said. Okay, so this is what was shouted out. We've got her. Here she is. Okay, so the person is announcing that they caught a woman and she's here. Notice the use of the exclamation mark as well, right, which adds emphasis to the person's excitement and victory. And notice it says it's all right, 
right? The person is confirming her identity. This is the person we're looking for. We didn't find the wrong person. We have the right person in our possession, okay? And the person concludes again, we caught her. There's a sense of gratification that whatever their goal uh, was, they went out and they achieved it. So now she's in front of, of them. And it says, there she was. Also note the use of the dash there. So the dash shows the persona's interrupted thought as he describes a woman in stanza two, which we are about to examine here. So before we begin stanza two, it is important for us to highlight the fact that the main poetic device that is used in this poem is an illusion. Okay, an illusion is a literary device, is a poetic device, and allusions are references in a literary work to a historical event, a myth, a religious text, or another work of literature. It can even be a painting, it can be music, it can be something that was done in the past. Okay. Now, to be specific, this is a biblical allusion from the Holy Bible, John chapter 8, verse 3 to 11, okay, where the woman was caught in the act of adultery and she was brought to Jesus, I'm talking about, in, but about the Bible, to be judged, okay? However, you will realize that one of the, one of the other devices that is used prevalently throughout this poem is the use of point of view. When we, since we are depending on the story in the Bible to shed light or to interpret this poem we are studying, we have to go back and forth to see what occurred in that story in John chapter 8 and what is happening in this poem, okay? One thing I want to point out is that the story which is told in John chapter 8 verse 3 to 11 is being told from a disciple's perspective, okay? But this poem is being told from by somebody who was a part of that team that captured the woman, okay? Now, point of view is a very powerful device, right? Uh, even in our lives, it's always important for us to understand different perspectives and different point of views before we come or we draw a conclusion, okay? I always said to myself, personally, even to others who know me, that there are three sides of a story. There's your side, there's her side, and then there's the truth, having listened to the discussion or even both sides. While in the Bible, we got the perspective of the disciples by actually allowing somebody who seemed to have been uh, uh, acting like the scribes and Pharisees in the Bible, I'm talking about the poem, by actually using that person to tell the story, we therefore got the opportunity or we are getting the opportunity to be in that person's mind and understand that person's most inner thoughts and feelings, okay? And of course, we will draw a con conclusions about that person's character by the time we get to the end of the poem, okay? So point of view and illusions are two big devices we're using to understand this poem. Okay, so let's begin stanza two. So stanza two says, a decent looking woman, you would have said, they often are. So the person is saying, you know what? If you would have seen this woman we captured, this woman we have in front of her, in front of us, you too would have agreed that she's a decent looking woman, but this suggests that the person is insinuating that the woman is really not decent, okay? And notice the use of the pronoun you. And when we are discussing or even when we are studying persuasive techniques, usually when a writer or even a, a public speaker or somebody, when you're talking to someone and you tend to use words like you, you're inviting them into your discussion. And even by extension, you tend to use the pronoun you as a a technique to get them to win over, to win them over, to take your side. Okay, so the person that says, a decent looking woman, you would have said, they often are. Notice that the person is also saying that a uh, decent looking women are the ones who are always found in that particular compromising position, which we'll learn more about as we go through the poem. The person is suggesting that as long as you're beautiful, most likely you are involved in these kind of fishy situations. That's basically what he's saying. This is also an example of sarcasm, right? So the woman is assumed to be a regular offender or prostitute, especially because she or they are often beautiful. Now, when we talk about sarcasm, remember, sarcasm is the appraisal to this praise. So it seems as though he's saying that she's a decent looking woman. And, and in one breath, he's in the other breath, he's saying they often are. Okay, he's dispraising her by saying, you know what, they, they might be beautiful and looking decent, but they're usually prostitutes. They're usually found in compromising position. The use of the bracket there is uh, the poetic device there. 
it, it actually underscores the persona's condescending attitude towards the woman. It gives us additional information about the persona's attitude there. So the person went on and he is describing the woman. He comes out and he says that she's beautiful. And notice that the woman, look, she looks dead scared. Because remember, they were the ones responsible for capturing this woman. And now that she's in front of them, he's saying, you know what? She's beautiful, but she's dead scared. One will like to think, why is it that this woman is scared? You know, what is it that they would have done to her while they were capturing her? What, why is it that she is so fearful? Why is it that she's looking the way in which she's looking? So besides saying that the woman is, um, she, you would have said that she's decent looking or she's beautiful or she's dead scared. The person went on and said that she's tousled. When somebody is tousled, their hair and appearance look untidy as if roughly handled. Okay. And also some might say that usually after some persons, when their hair is in the state of probably being loose, having been engaged in sexual activities, that their one's hair tends to look untidy as well. Right, so the person is suggesting that whatever she was doing, this is why she's looking um, tussled. This is what the person is saying, but I want you to remember this. So as we go through the poem, you will draw your own conclusion about what the person is saying. Is it the case that you sided with him or is it the case that having listened to his side, that you now have a different perspective or, you know, you are actually probably playing in Switzerland. Okay, and the person is saying he, as if he's trying to make excuses. He said that, yes, of course, she's looking dead scared and she's tousled her hair and so on is looking untidy you know what we rough up now but we even though we rough up it's just a little thing nothing much okay so the person is trying to excuse or to distance himself away from how the woman appears there to the public and notice that he uses the euphony, euphemism a little which is in pink i remember euphemism a euphemism is when you use a, a softer word in place of a harsh or impolite word Right, so that he, in this case, by saying a little, the person not justifies himself or tries to make himself look virtuous. He's not taking any blame for the way in which this woman appears. And as we examine the rest of the poem, you will understand why. Okay, but before I move on to stanza three, notice that we have several examples of visual imagery which appeals to the reader's sense of sight in order to visualize the woman's present physical appearance. Right, so the person has said that she's beautiful, she's looking dead scared and even tousled. Okay, all that, all those are examples of visual imagery, and even of course the use of the diction. Diction is the actually the person's choice of words and how they help to enhance your understanding of the poem of the situation we are studying. And diction there is in purple and and yellow. So if you want to use diction in this poem, you can use any of those words. And of course, remember what I said when you're using diction, you have to give a definition of that word and also the example in the poem and comment on how they would have, how they would have enhanced your understanding of the poem. Okay. So stanza three says, and not, and not the first time by any means, she's felt men's hands greedy over her body, but always were virtuous, of course. So the person says that, and it's not the first time by any means, she's felt men's hands over her body. So the person is trying to distance himself and also justify the, the, the little rough up they gave her in the previous stanza. Okay, and just, by, just, just in case you want to judge me because I am expected to be um, a religious person, and we know this because this particular situation is similar to the account in the Bible where it was described, the scribes and Pharisees who brought the woman to Jesus. So therefore, the person who is speaking, you know, you tend to think of that person as a religious person who was actually victimizing this woman. Okay, so just in case you expect me to be all religious and, and, you know, want to talk about, okay, that's not expected from somebody like me, just know that this is not the first time men's hand actually touched this woman's body. Okay, and notice that he said that she's felt men's hands greedy all over her body. So felt men's hands greedy all over her body is an example of tactile imagery because it appeals to your sense of uh, touch. And the word felt actually gives us that, 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 that particular feeling as well. Right. And even um, besides touch, it's also an example of visual imagery because it appears to a sense of sight where we can imagine a lot of men's hands just moving across different parts of the woman's body as well. So the reader can visualize all of this. And notice that the person, there's a dash here. The persona, there tends to be a lot of dashes so far in the poem, in the stances we have studied, because the persona appears to have a lot of interrupted thoughts 
okay, where he's always adding information, whether to distance himself or to justify his actions. And notice after the dash here, the person will make sure he put it out there that ours were virtuous, of course. So now number one, it's bad enough that you, the woman up here tussled and she's obviously in front of us looking dead scared, right? You even said that you rough her up a, bit, a, a little, yet you want to tell us at this point that what you did to her, the little touch you might have given her, who knows where that touch actually occurred. You or the other men who actually brought her here to be stoned, we, God knows where exactly you all touch her, but you are telling the public, you are telling the listener that the touching that she received from you all is what actually what? Virtuous. And notice that he says, of course. Okay, so the person claims that the hands of the, uh, his hands and the crowd who brought the woman to be stoned are righteous since they are arresting a sinner. Right, so because she's a sinner, they're not a sinner. They're saying that you know what, whatever touch she would have, a, got, she received from us, they are virtual touch, right, or virtual touches. And the person also added the word of course, suggests to uh, a need to defend his his action as well. Okay, so in the Bible, the scribes and Pharisees were often criticized as being self righteous and hypocritical. And of course, we are seeing this same behavior in the person today. So you see how the person's behavior is actually. Well, similar to the way in which the scribes and the Pharisees behaved in the Bible. Okay, so there's an example of poetic devices here. And of course, I, there, I want to comment on the on irony. Okay, reading an irony is both a figurative device and a poetic device. Right, there are different types of irony. There's verbal irony, situation irony, and even dramatic irony, which you, you, you see in dramas. Okay, but in this case, where the irony is concerned, the crowd is ready to condemn others while they themselves are guilty. Now, you are bringing this woman to be stoned to death, which you will see clearer in the following stanzas. You're bringing this woman because she's a sinner, because as you, we, you, you let the reader assume that she was caught in some compromising position where men are concerned. Right, and you're telling us, you know what? Yes, of course, yes, of course we rough her up. You know, we rough her up, we even let her rough up, and so on. And uh, you know, we probably touch some somewhere we're not supposed to touch. But because she's a sinner, excuse us, man. You can't look at us because we are virtuous people. Okay, so just just overlook all of that and um, just stone her to death. So this is ironic because this crowd, this person who's touching a woman's body, or even the way in which she's treating the woman, right? The violence that we're seeing with the different tussled and roughed up is not something that you should expect, expect from somebody who's virtuous, somebody who is expected to be a religious person where compassion and kindness is bestowed to others seem to be doing the opposite. So irony is one of those devices you will see prevalently throughout the poem as we analyze the poem line by line. Let's go to stanza four. So stanza four says, and if our fingers bruise her shuttering skin, those were love bites compared to the hail of kisses of stone, the last assault and battery frigid rape to come off right. Okay, so there are a lot of things that's happening here in stanza four. So let's begin with the first line. So the first line says, and if our fingers bruised, the word if they suggest that the person is still trying to explain uh, any possible bruise, he's still trying to distance himself from the woman appearing tussled and dead scared. Okay, he's still trying to justify why we should excuse the fact that him, along with the other men there present, hands actually crawling all over the woman's body, touching wherever. He's still justifying and making excuses. That's what the word if there tells us. So he says, and if our fingers bruised her shuttering skin, which suggests that there's a possibility that bruises are on the woman's body as well, okay? So if our fingers bruise her shuddering skin, shuddering there means that she's actually there shaking suddenly and violently or into some unpleasant thought of fear. God knows what had happened to that woman, that she's there shuddering, she's actually there shaking. Do you remember in the previous stanzas we learned that she's, she's dead scared? because something is wrong. Whether she's afraid of what is happening to her or what has happened to her so far, we do not know. But what we do know is that she's just there shaking violently and suddenly. So the person says, and if our fingers bruised her shuttered skin, those were love bites. Notice that the person saying, you know what, if you're seeing bruised on top of her shaky skin, she's there shaking. Oh God, call it love bites, okay? Notice the word love there, our love bites. The person, instead of saying bruises, or, you know, um, bleeding or anything like that. The person is attaching the word bites to love there. 
This is an example of diction. We can use love bite to discuss diction, and it can also be used as visual imagery. Where visual imagery is concerned, the reader is able to visualize the woman's fear or bruises and even assault and battery and rape, which we will discuss later on in this, uh, in this stanza. Okay? And also, it's an example of euphemism. So euphemisms are occurred when we use words that are softer in place of words that are harsh or impolite. So instead of saying that those were bruises, right, the person is calling them what? Love bites. What we know about love bites? We know that love bites are basically uh, what, what they call hickey or bruises that are, are marks that are left on somebody's body having been involved in sexual activities. That's what the person is calling love bites. Right? Notice that he's using words like love just so that he won't pay attention or you won't even consider the fact that the woman, they probably beat the woman up. You know, he's trying to account for the way in which the woman is looking, the bruises that might be on her body there. So the person says, and if our fingers bruised or shattering skin, these were love bites compared to the hail of kisses of stone. So the person is saying, you know what? Whatever you're seeing there on her body right now, she might be bruising, she might be bleeding, she might have bruises. Whatever you're seeing, they cannot be compared to what? To the hail of kisses of stone, right? So kisses of stone is an example of post-vacation because the person, or we know that the woman will be stoned to death. Not will be, that she was brought to be stoned to death. That's basically why they captured her. So the person is saying, you know what? She appeared tussled, she looked dead scared, we were for up. All these different things that the person is saying. Right, but the person's also making false excuses by saying, you know what, all that we would have done, call them love bites, man, call them love bites, because this cannot be compared to the hail of cases of, of stone. This is basically, to the hail of cases of stone, is basically saying that whatever little would have done to her is nothing compared to, to the stoning she's about to receive. That's basically what he's saying there with all those flowery language there. Okay, we know what is a hail. A hail is a, a large number of small objects falling together. Okay, I know it can be like a hail or snow. And if you're actually, because she will be stoned, not just by one person, but several persons, it will, you know, all come at her at once because, you know, the intention is to kill her. So they are, they are being described as the hail of kisses of stone. Notice the, the example of personification. The person is still trying to make this stoning that is about to happen to this woman, make it flowery or even to soften the blow to distance himself so that he can appear virtuous to whoever is listening or whoever is reading the poem. Okay, so the person went on and he says there, and the word stone is actually a metaphor for the judgment that the woman is going to receive. It, the stone is basically what is going, what is what will be used to bring judgment. Okay, the person went on and he says the last assault. So they're saying that this is her last assault. I want you to also pay attention to the sexual words that the person is using because number one, the person already establishes that what he's a virtuous person, but then he's using words like um, tussled. He, you're hearing describing about men's hands greedy all over her body, and he's using words like love bites and kisses of stone. This man seemed to have sex in his mind. He seemed to be lusting after this woman, which is really ironic because you are telling me that, well, one, lusting is a sin to look at a woman lustfully, you know, as if you're designed her to have sex and so on with her. And a virtual person is not expected to be having these thoughts. Yet you're bringing this same woman to be stoned. That's why this is ironic. If anything, you should be stoned. So you see why the poem is called a stone straw? While we are talking about the physical stoning, or we are talking about you living or you are located a stone straw away from something, that when you're throwing stone at people, check yourself, because you too could be caught up or even be committing the very same sin. Okay? So the person says, to the hail of kisses of stone. And the last assault. Now he uses the word. He uses the word assault. Okay. When you assault somebody, it's basically a. It can be physical. It can be verbal. A violent act. Right. It can also be a crime of forcing a person to submit sexual intercourse against their will. So you see, the, the, this particular man, this this persona to be specific, who's claiming that he's virtuous. Looking at look at all these sexual words he's using when he's talking or describing the woman. In fact, he's calling it the last assault. He's called it all as well, and battery frigid rape, right? So now a battery can be described in so many ways, okay? It can be, um, well, in criminal law, it is a physical act that results in harmful or offensive contact with another person without that person's consent. Doesn't that sound like rape? 
right? He's saying, you know what? This is the last assault. This is how the person is actually describing the stoning of this woman. Eh? He's saying that, you know what? The bruises and so on, they call them love bites. The stoning is kisses and so on on her body. And he's saying that um, it's the last assault as if there was a previous one before. The person went on and even says, and the battery frigid rape, right? The word battery. As if he's actually getting sensual pleasure from the stoning of this woman. Now, this certainly does not sound like a virtuous person. You know, if anything, he should be stoned as well. Yet it is the woman who is being victim victimized. It is the woman who is being brought to be stoned to death. Okay? And let's go on to the last two lines in that sentence. Notice, let me just read reread again from the last assault and battery frigid rape to come off right. Now, the word to come is a pawn. We said that pawn is a figurative device. That's the use of um, an amusing use of words that have the same sound but different meaning. And when they're used, it's really to emphasize a particular point, a particular meaning. So the person is saying, you know what? These are the things that are about to come to the woman. Okay? She's about to receive hail of kisses of stone. She's about to receive um, an, what we call the last assault, a battery, a frigid rape, and... Uh, Frigid there means um, lacking warm and unfriendliness. Eh? It also means lacking a person's sympathy and sensuality, which we know um, resembles rape or the sexual language or thoughts that the person is having. But let me say a bit more about the pun. So when we talk about a pun, we say that a, a pun actually uh, words that have the same song but different meaning. So if the, if the person is saying, no, these are the things to come, the hail of kisses of stone, the last assault, the battery, and the frigid rape. Notice that he's actually using frigid rape to describe stoning a woman. What does that have to do with stoning or killing somebody at this point, right? And he's saying to come. So now to come could be the future stoning of the woman right something that will happen in the future and also it can be the colloquial word for male ejaculation which is usually spelled c-o-m you understand these are the kind of thoughts that this this virtuous man had actually have inside of his head these are the thoughts that's why we're saying that when the point of view is a very important poetic device because it allows the person to speak when you allow somebody to speak i always tell students that characterization can be constructed in different ways, right? You can say who you are. Persons can actually comment the things that persons say about you, even if you are, you are who you are by your actions as well, okay? Although you can get characterization from the things that persons say about you, although you should be very mindful too, because there are some persons, when they're describing somebody, it is not always truthful. When you really get to the investigation of the, the background story, it's usually ended in some jealousy or misunderstanding. So I'm just saying where characterization is concerned, sometimes it's not always best to, to get it from what somebody thinks, but to actually take a holistic um, consideration to make that determination of somebody's character. And so far where this person is concerned and where the device of, of point of view is concerned, because we have the point of view of somebody who was doing the stoning. So that person in the Bible would have been the Pharisees and the scribe. We realize that really and truly they are hypocrites. You know, we are seeing their hypocrisy. We are seeing that they too need to be in the place of the woman to be stoned to death as well. Because he's stoning this woman and all these sexual thoughts that he's having here, he too has committed a sin. He too should be seen as a sinner. He's certainly not virtuous. So stanza five says, three lines, for justice must be done, especially when it tastes so good. So notice that the person sees what they are about to do to the woman as justice. This is the only how they can achieve justice by the stoning and this lustful desire for this woman. They are saying at the end of the day that this is this is justice. So the, justice, so the person says, for justice must be done, especially when it tastes so good. So the person has recognized that, well, we will admit from what we would have studied so far, that the person is actually lost in this woman. And notice that he introduces what? Gustatory imagery. Gustatory imagery occurs when words appeal to our sense of taste, right? Well, we don't know exactly what he's tasting, but so far, he is actually having sensual pleasure from the, just thinking about the actual stone of the woman. The stone, it hasn't... Uh, it hasn't begun at this point, okay? But he's anticipated all these sexual pleasures during the stoning of this woman, okay? 
So the use of um, diction is there in this poem. So the use of words like justice and specially, it tells us about the personal anticipation for the sexual pleasure, which I um, underscored a while ago. And of course, the word tastes so good. It tells us basically that the persona, I don't even want to say he's a pervert because, you know, the persona is really, he really should be in the stead of the woman in this case. Okay, because he's having all these sexual thoughts and as if, it, I mean, in his mind, he is being turned on. The very knowledge of knowing that this woman is going to be stoned to death is actually brings him pleasure. So just before we begin stanza six, I just want to highlight that the person that ended the previous stanza by saying that whatever they are about to do to the woman, whatever they would have done, it is off right. Off right actually means that it is just, it is fair, it is good, it is righteous, it's virtuous, moral. We have not done anything wrong. That's basically what the person is saying. Okay, I just wanted you to keep that in mind. So there's a lot of things happening in stanza six. So in stanza six, the person says, and then. So, and then suggest that after everything that was happening, just when they were about to begin the stoning, there was an intruder. Somebody actually entered the picture. And notice the, the, the different names that the persona actually, or labels that the persona gives to this person. It even appears as if the persona actually ran out of labels. And even the, the way in which he's talking about this intruder or this person who interceded, it, he's actually speaking about the person in a scornful way, okay? So then the person says, and then this guru, preacher, God merchant, God knows what, spoil the whole thing. Well, somebody actually rain, <laughs> actually rain on the person's parade, okay? Now, a guru is actually somebody who is a religious leader, okay? It's usually somebody who tends to be an influential teacher or a popular export on a, the subject, okay? In this case, the intruder will appear to be a subject, an, an export on what is about to happen here in this particular event with this woman. So the person says, and then this guru, preacher, God march and God knows what. Notice that the person actually, when he uses the word, the expression, God knows what, it suggests that he doesn't even know what else to call this person, okay? He seriously does not know what else to call the person. So the person ran out of scorn for labels for this, this particular um, character, this particular person intruded, right? So the person ironically uses this term, which usually means something impossible to know. Right, which which actually mean only God knows. But even when we consider the Bible, the Bible indicates that God literally does know who Jesus is. Right, that's if we are um, taking into consider consideration the account that is given in John chapter eight, verse three to eleven. Right. Anyhow, the person went on and he says that this person spoiled the whole thing. Right, and this is how the person spoiled the whole thing, which is how the person interrupted the stoning of the woman. The person says that this man did this by speaking to her should never speak to them notice that he's referring to the woman as them you know because she's sinful because they actually caught her doing something that they figure is a sin forgetting that he too along with the other men have committed sin even in their minds and even physically as well with this very same woman so the person says should never speak to them right and with this additional information the use of the bracket emphasize the person has scorn for this woman and the person went on and, and tells us that the person who intruded the man who came into the picture actually squatted on the ground and notice the dash there her level as if he is surprised because in his mind she's a sinner we are all virtuous here is wanting to speak to this woman but you're actually you're actually squatting you're actually going down to her level to speak to her. What madness is this? Okay, so the person is really uh, upset and surprised by this person's action. Squatting is actually, when somebody squats, they actually position themselves close to the ground by bending their legs under them and balancing on the front part of their feet with their legs bent under their body. Okay, so in the Bible, what's happening here is that when the woman in when Mary Magdalene was brought to Jesus to be judged because the Pharisees said that she was caught in the act of adultery, it is said that Jesus actually squatted and came down to her level because she was placed on the floor and instead of talking to her, shouting at her, he, he actually squatted and he came down to her level and he spoke to her, right? And it is said that the man actually wrote something in the dust. The person says that squatting on the ground, her level, writing in the dust, something that we couldn't see. So they suggest that the, the intruder or the man actually saw value in this woman, okay? 
Sometimes in the Christian Bible, we are told that Jesus will always leave wherever he is and come to our level. It doesn't matter where we are, wherever we will have fallen, he will meet us where we are in order to for us to know that we have a friend in him, in order to know that he, he, he doesn't have any limitation in bestowing compassion and forgiveness to us. He treats us he treats us all on one level okay he comes on to our level just to show us that we are loved okay that we are loved so the person that says that this man squatting on the ground he person went to her level and the person wrote something in the dust something that they couldn't read at all okay and the person went on and said and that same person saw in her something that we couldn't see okay and of course for somebody to actually uh, intru intrude and actually went down to that woman's level to speak to her, right? Shows that the person was compassionate, right? Unlike these the men and the, the person and the other men with the person who call themselves virtuous. Virtuous persons are persons who are moral, persons who, you know, knows right from wrong and expect to show compassion to those who are less fortunate. They weren't exercising that particular quality at all. You know, but this person who the person describes as a guru, preacher, God merchant. God merchant suggests that that person is in the business of working for God. And preacher suggests that he preaches about the gospel. He preaches about things that are of God. Okay? So the person says, and the, he saw in us something that we couldn't see. If you consider the Christian Bible where um, it is said that Jesus stayed on the cross because he knew our future. He knew that we needed him. Maybe not even in that generation, in his decade, in his time, but it's only today where we are, we realize the power of the cross and how necessary it is for, the, for humankind, for all mankind. Okay? The person went on and says, at least until he turned his eyes on us. So notice that the person said that he saw something in her that we couldn't see. Right, he couldn't see. They they couldn't understand what value. They couldn't understand what love that this person or respect um, that this person showed to this person. They, but they understood it at this point. At this point, they said that they understood it at least when when the man, the person intruded, turned their eyes on us. So the person actually looked at them. So when the person, the man actually looked at them, it fo it forces them to actually have an uh, introspection of their hearts and their lives. Where they start their hearts and realize that really and truly, none of you here can throw the first stone. None of you here can actually prosecute this woman. None of you here can actually stone her because you are not without sin. So when they sort yourself, and that's that's one of the reasons why persons find it hard to actually sit with themselves. There's some persons who just do not like their own company, you know. They do not like their own silence because of what that silence reveals about them. They make it through the dark side. Okay, so basically, when this man who in the Bible is actually Jesus, actually, but they didn't remember the poem, they didn't give, the, the person is not called Jesus. The person is also not called a Pharisee or a scribe, but the way in which the person behaves and the things that the person says, he behaves the way in which the scribes and Pharisees behaved in the Bible. Okay? So when the person says, he turned his eyes on us, it tells us that when the the intruder, who is the Jesus figure in the in the Bible, actually looked at them. It forces them to actually have a introspection of their hearts and their minds, where they realize that really and truly, we are no better than this woman. The person went on and said that her eyes on us, she looked at all of them. She stared them in their eyes. And they too were forced to really actually... Um, consider their conscience to actually have well we assume or we would not assume but we would expect that after she would have looked at them they would say really and truly we should exercise forgiveness or exercise mercy okay there's even a possibility i'm saying a possibility that even when she looked her eyes um be, so, well, her eyes was on them or the eyes, her eyes were on them that they probably remembered because a lot of men were there you know doing this story even those who the very men who captured her who knows that if they were even you know one of those men or one of her customers or even had sexual relations with her in the past who knows it is not in the poem i'm just saying putting it into context right so it's a case where when when the when the person says that her eyes on us by actually looking at them at a point when they're taking an introspection, they're thinking about their hearts and their minds and the decisions they would have made in the past, they too remembered possibly that really and truly, you know, I should be in her position. I should be stoned, right? And notice that it, it ends, stanza six ends by saying, our eyes on ourselves. They too are forced to have that personal introspection to search their hearts and really see that they are wicked people 
And if anything, all who would have sinned, all who have sinned and come short of God's glory, really and truly deserves stoning as well. Okay, so when their eyes, when the, the, the man's eyes, the intruder, uh, eyes actually were, were placed on the woman and the crowd, including the persona, they were actually forced to actually have a heart to heart with themselves, however quiet, however quietly it was done. Okay, so there are some poetic devices there, the use of the dashes I told you at the beginning here, where it says, and then the guru, right here, and then the guru, the preacher, God march on God knows what. Notice here, the dash right here is really show it shows us from time to time that as the persona speaks, there's a lot of interruption, right? And the interruption is there because he's actually struggling to actually um come up with scornful labels for the persona, right? And the use of the bracket emphasizes the persona scorn, where it says here in green that they should never speak to them, right? It shows that the person is objectifying the woman. He's, you know, instead of saying her or just um, treating the situation as an isolated situation, he's generalizing as them because, you know, she's beautiful. And every other woman, every other woman, right, or women generally, as long as they are beautiful, that they should be stoned as well, right? And the different diction here outlines the person's scorns and labels, as I would have said. And it tells us a lot about his attitude uh, towards the subject, which is the woman in this case. And I must highlight the repetition of the word eyes here in pink. Right here, he turned his eyes on us and her eyes on us, our eyes on ourselves. Right, this repetition highlights that everyone has committed a sin that requires stoning. That's why we had eyes, people just looking at each other to realize that you're all really and truly, we are on the same level where God is concerned, you know. There's no hierarchy where salvation is concerned. There's no hierarchy even of sin where, um, where God is concerned. Sin is sin at the end of the day. So that's the end of stanza six. So stanza seven says, we walked away still holding stones that we may throw another day given the urge. So what's basically happened here after that lovely experience that the persona, the intruder, and even the crowd and the woman had there, you know, one would have expected that there would have been a change of heart. There would have been forgiveness, right? Their mercy would have been extended to the woman. Or, you know, there's a change of heart to treat people differently with tolerance and forgiveness and so on. Right. But in stanza seven, we realize that, yes, of course, after that, you know, the stoning didn't happen. Instead, they all walked away. But notice that they walked away, still holding stones. They didn't even drop the stones. They didn't even put the stones on the ground to say, you know what? You know, I, I washed my hands from what I was about to do. I too should be stoned. I should have known better. You know, let me just turn a, a new page here. Instead, they walked away, still holding stones that they may throw. Notice the use of the word may there will suggest that they will throw these stones or they will stone somebody if they choose to in the future. It's their decision that they may. So it's one thing for you to throw away a weapon. And especially when you're about to um, turn a new leaf, you're about to live a life that is um, virtuous, one that is moral, where you get along with persons and so on. And it's one thing for you to say you're changed and you still walk away with that same weapon. It's like, for example, you're saying that you, uh, you, you have given up drugs or gang war where you're getting rid of your gun, you know, but it's one thing to say you change and then you, you're selling marijuana or cocaine still, or you have gone walk, walk, walking around tongue with, or posing off and so on with. You tend that is a case where if you are changed, you should see it in your fruit, you should see it in your behavior. But after such a lovely experience in Stanza 6, where they were actually forced to have an introspection of their hearts and see where they too have sinned, notice that they have, they are walk, they have walked away still holding stones that they may throw another day given the urge. Notice the use of the word urge. Imagine that they will be acting on an urge. An urge is actually a strong desire to engage in sexual relation with somebody. Hmm? So an urge can be just a strong feeling to do something, but it also means this strong desire to have a sexual um, activity to have a um, sexual relation with somebody else. So it seems as though the crowd and the persona they haven't learned their lesson. They didn't learn the lesson at all, at all, at all. So the accusers leave, but like a bully, they have been shamed. That's basically what that introspection did to them. You know? They have been shamed because they got to realize that they should be stoned. They're no better than this woman. But the person that tries to salvage some pride by insisting that he has not changed. He is capable of prosecuting someone again if he just feels like it. You understand? 
So this is the power and the effectiveness of the use of point of view as a poetic device because we got the opportunity to actually be in the persona's mind, to really see that really and truly person is not a virtuous person. If you compare this particular experience in the poem or the poem where the, the behavior of the person is concerned to the account that is shared in the Bible by one of the disciples, I think um, where writers are concerned when they do that, it's a case where they give the reader the opportunity to hear both sides. Okay, we go to John chapter 8, verse 3 to 11. We hear the account of the disciples, which is favorable to Jesus because it shows that Jesus is called compassionate. He is there for those who are seen as low in society. And he treats us and he comes to us where we are. He meets us where we are to build us up. Because now some might say, okay, okay maybe the account in the Bible is a, it's a biased account because we know that the disciples work for Jesus. But what this poet did, um, and by poet I'm referring to Elma Mitchell, she has used the poetic device in a powerful way where she allowed the person to speak in the poem, unlike a disciple, this person um, represents, in this case, a Pharisee on a scribe, right? Those persons who brought the woman to judge, ju to, to, for justice or for stoning. Okay, so we get to see that really and truly that this person's mind is, is very sinful. This person is deserving um, stoning, if anything, right? So we have come to the end of the poem, A Stone Straw. Let's examine the themes, poetic, de themes, poetic devices, and the moods. Okay, so these are the themes in the poem. Feel free to comment in the comment section and share if you have discovered any other themes that aren't mentioned here. We have conflicts and complications. Um, discrimination, religion, appearance versus reality, hypocrisy, oppression, power and powerlessness, people and desires, violence, sexism, forgiveness and unforgiveness, and man versus man. Okay, and all these can be found in throughout the poem at different parts of the poem, different sections. We also have the different poetic devices, allusion, pun, and we said that allusion is one of the main ones because we need or we are depending on the story in the bible or the story of mary magdalene the woman who was caught in the act of adultery in the holy bible john chapter 8 verse 3 to 11 to shed light on the poem to help us with our interpretation okay so we have the allusion poetic devices diction repetition sarcasm contrast irony euphemism metaphor personification and imagery i do not have here point of view but please add it okay because um throughout the poem that's one of the the um prevalent devices we use in order for us to understand what was really happening here okay and of course all of these po um, poetic devices i discussed all of them when we met them line by line in the different stanzas okay so these are the different tones there isn't just one tone in this poem Okay, there's excitement there at the beginning of the poem when the person has shouted, we've got her, here she is, as if they're celebrating because they captured the woman. Okay, there's uh, examples of self-righteousness where the person is actually depending on um, his definition of righteousness, things that he would have done, or uh, things that he think that he didn't do to actually establish his virtuousness. Okay, he seemed to be giving himself the quality of righteousness when he's certainly not behaving that way. Okay, he's certainly not behaving virtuous in anything, which is a quality he claimed for himself in the earlier parts of the poem. And of course, that sexual ideas are there throughout the poem, especially in the first three to four stanzas as well, before the intruder or the man actually enter the picture. He seemed a bit callous and harsh, even when he's talking about the woman, the stoning of this woman. He's saying that this is right, this is just, this is fair. You know, there seemed not to be any compassion or mercy there for the woman. And of course, he's scornful. He refers to the woman as them. He objectifies her because um, she's beautiful, therefore, or he suggests that all beautiful women are, are, are found in compromising position as the position that they claim that they found her in, okay? The person has seemed annoyed, that's why I have annoyance there, when the intruder actually in, came into the picture. It is because of this person that they were unable to actually stone the woman to death, okay? And discuss this scene there, not even for the woman and also for the intruder. Notice the names that he called the intruder. This guru, preacher, God much and God knows what. You know, he's so disgusted that he tried to come up with a lot of scornful labels. Okay, for that person who actually interrupted the stoning. Of course, the person is damn sarcastic. At one point, it seems as though he's saying a decent looking woman, but really and truly, he's dispraising her. He's saying that in what these 
beautiful or decent looking women are the ones that we should really look out for. They are the ones who are, which he suggests, are prostitutes or adulteress. Okay. And with their examples of sinister where he, the, even the, the words that are used to describe the stone in, such as hail of kisses of stone, the last assault, there seem to be this impending evil or harm that he wishes on the woman. Okay, and of course, I think that's very um, clear throughout the poem, and he's very judgmental. He seems to be making conclusions about who the, who the woman is. You know, she's a decent looking woman, she, they're usually um, caught in compromising position. And notice that he has so much to say even about the intruder who entered the poem as well. Okay, and if you can come up with any more tones, feel free to share it with the others and all of us in the comment section below. I will really appreciate that. So we have the moods. When we talk about the moods, unlike the tone, when we talk about the tones in the poem, we are talking about the, the um, person's attitude towards the subject. So in the case of this poem, A Stone Show, we are talking about the attitude of the person towards the woman who is being brought to be stoned. Okay, although keep in mind that the stoning did not happen. Okay, but when we talk about moods, we are talking about the person's choice of words and how these words actually created certain feelings in us. Okay, as we study the poem, as we read the poem. So for me, and throughout, in stanza one, there's some feeling of curiosity when the person shouted out, oh, we've got her, here she is, it's her, right? You know, we're curious, we're wondering, okay, what did this woman do? Why is it that they're so excited that they, they captured her, or they got her? Okay, there's some disgust on the part of, for the, for the persona, the way in which he's actually using these sexual words to sexualize a stoning. Right, and this is not just like you're just stoning somebody, this stone just bounces off like a ball or a mushroom or something. You know, the, the intention of this stoning is to actually kill the woman, but he's using all these sexual tones, which suggests that he's getting sensual feelings from the actual idea of this woman being stoned. So I felt feelings, I had feelings of disgust. I was disappointed at the person now because he appears to be, as he keeps trying to justify himself as virtuous and so on, a religious figure. And you expect somebody who is religious to, you know, extend mercy and compassion and not to encourage violence. But the words that the person who uses as he talk about this woman, talk about the situation and so on, they are one of violence. You know, where he's calling the stone in the last assault, battery, frigid, rape. And he noticed that after saying all of these things that he's hoping to happen to the woman, he justifies them by, by saying that they are upright, they are fair. You understand? They are moral. Nothing is wrong with what we are about to do. And then for me, the sense of relief when that intruder actually entered the picture and actually spoiled the whole thing, as the person says, right? I well, was relieved that this woman was not, she will not be stoned because of the intruder and him actually allowing them to search themselves. And of course, I felt happy in the end, although I was a bit disappointed because disappointed is seen where in that last stanza where they said that, oh, we walked away, still, we're still holding stones. I mean, after such a lovely experience where you are actually forced to consider yourself, to have a deep introspection of your heart and who you are, realize that you too are a sinner, that therefore this woman therefore deserve mercy and compassion. After realizing that you too should be stoned, one will assume or one would expect a person in this case will, you know, change his heart. But notice that he walked away still holding the stone. And I was totally disappointed by that, just by, you know, hearing those words. And I was happy, you know, feeling of happiness that the woman was not stoned. Okay. And if you are familiar with the account in the Bible by the disciple, um, Jesus in the Bible said, woman, where are thy accusers, which is not in the poem. And she said that they're not there. They actually walked away. And he said to her in the Bible that I have not condemned you. So just go and say no more. Okay. That part was not included in the poem, but I was happy overall with the ending of the poem and with the intruder and the, you know, everything that happened about the eyes, the repetition of the eyes there, which focuses or forces those present to actually search their hearts. Right. So this is a summary of the poem. The crowd catches a woman to be stoned. The persona, addressing an unknown audience, objectifies and scorns the woman. The persona justifies his treatment of the woman as righteous after highlighting that it is not the first time the woman had felt men's hand on her body as he anticipates sensual pleasure from stoning the woman. However, as the persona prepares to execute justice, a man interrupts them by squatting on the ground in order to speak to the woman. The man writes something in the dust that no one can read, which forces the woman to see her value as the crowd is forced to address their conscience. 
The crowd leaves with their stones just in case they have a strong desire to stone someone else. Thank you for listening and please see my other videos. Like, share, comment and subscribe. Until next week, take care.